Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our theme first for our message today is taken from our reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when the Lord says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. As Christians, we acknowledge that our real power is not our own. Rather, our power comes from on high. Uh, speaking of power from on high, you might see, or maybe you already did yesterday, some power from on high this weekend. I'm talking, of course, about fireworks. Fireworks are a lot of fun, and, and the bigger, the better, right? Fireworks, they make us ooh and ah. They provide a spectacular, explosive special effects. Today, maybe you'll fire up the grill and fire up the sky as well. Well, in our epistle lesson, Paul talks about some spectacular heavenly special effects in 2 Corinthians. Paul describes the vision of a man who was caught up into heaven and saw indescribable scenes that would put simple fireworks to shame. But there's an interesting phrase in there that could throw us off track. What is caught up to the third heaven mean? Uh, it may sound like Paul's insinuating that there's like different levels of eternity, but no, he's actually talking about different levels of the sky. This was rather common terminology for talking about the, well, the, the stuff that is above us. Um, there's three levels. The first level of heaven was the, the atmosphere or like the clouds, you might say. The second level of heaven was the starry host. Um, and the third level of heaven is what we probably most commonly in common parlance think of when we hear heavens, the place where God dwells. So when Paul talks about the third, caught up to the third heaven, he's saying um, not just to the clouds, not to the sky, but to where God dwells. Now, this man, you could, you could, you could, not be convinced, and that's fine, it doesn't really affect anything, but the man that Paul is talking about is, is actually himself. In, in verse 7, Paul switches to the first person. Uh, he says that he was given a thorn in his flesh to keep him from being conceited about seeing these great visions, and plus it, it really fits very nicely into Paul's argument if Paul is talking about himself. Um, again, it doesn't, if, you, if, you're, if you're unsure, that's fine. It doesn't really affect anything. Uh, but it, it sort of makes it say, make even more sense when we think about these visions and we realize that Paul's kind of humbly, you might say, talking about himself. Um, in verse, uh, you, you see, Paul is dealing with an interesting situation in, in the city of Corinth. Um, he's dealing with competition from, the, from Corinth, from guys who were called super apostles. Um, now, these guys cared a lot more about being super than they cared about, oh, I went, than they cared about um, being apostles. Uh, these guys were claiming that they were kind of the newer and better version of apostles, so more like maybe apostles 2.0 is what they called themselves. And many of them were professional orators and entertainers you know, think a lot like um, talk show hosts or YouTubers, and they were looking to make money. They had done this before Paul arrived, but they took a new tact when Christianity started to take hold among some. One of their selling points was claiming to have had spectacular visions. And many Corinthian Christians were impressed by these stories, and were beginning to wonder, you know, who should, if there's some contradiction, who should we listen to, Paul or the super apostles? Um, after all, Paul was admittedly, he says himself, not quite as exciting or dynamic as these for-profit uh, entertainers. Now, Paul brings up this vision to point out, though, that he is just as legitimate as his opponents. Um, Paul's had plenty of visions. He could have regaled them with his vision, such as the one where Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus or an angel warning him of a, when a shipwreck was about to happen and what he and the inhabitants or uh, passengers on the ship should do. Or he could have told him about the Macedonian man appearing to Paul in a vision and begging him to come to Macedonia. 
Now, this vision, it's, it's hard to tell because Paul really doesn't give us any details. But it seems like this is maybe a different vision, but that's really sort of immaterial. Paul says, what he's saying is, look, you want a vision competition, I could win a vision competition, but that doesn't really matter. And so I'm not even really going to tell you about all these other visions, and I'm not even going to tell you any of the details of my vision. Instead, Paul says, I'd rather talk to you about my weaknesses. Why? Because the gospel is not about me, says Paul. It's not about you. Well, it is, but not about glorifying you, or it's certainly not about glorifying these so-called super apostles. The gospel is really about Jesus Christ, who came to save sinners. Now, these super apostles are not looking out for your interest, Paul says, and they're certainly not looking out for the gospel. No, what they want is your money and your allegiance. Um, the gospel, Paul is reminding them, is not about the achievements of humankind. It's not about being great or spectacular. It's a, about salvation through Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. And therefore, Paul says, your focus should be on Jesus and on the cross. The Corinthians' focus and their leader's example, Paul says, should be consistent with the message of man's weakness and God's power to save. So if it's not consistent, Paul says, you've got to begin to wonder whether you're looking at the real thing or fake. Because God doesn't, didn't look to impress or wow people into believing in him, right? He sent Jesus rather to be rejected, to die, in part because humanity doesn't really need to be encouraged to embrace their pride or become any more infatuated with power than we already are. No, what we really need is to repent and to turn back to God for help. So Paul says, Let, if I'm going to brag, like all these guys who are bragging, I'll brag, but I'm going to brag about my weaknesses. God sent me visions, but he also sent me a thorn in the flesh. Now, Paul's really leaving us in the dark quite a bit. Now, it's possible that the Corinthians, they know exactly what Paul's talking about, but we don't. And there's been a lot of speculation. What's Paul's thorn in the flesh? We don't really know what it was. Some have guessed that maybe it was his eyesight was failing him, or maybe it was a temptation or demonic oppression or, or something else. It's quite possible, like I said, the Corinthians knew, but we don't. But what we do know is that it was making Paul's life harder, and he wanted it gone, but God did not take it away. The point was very clear for Paul. Paul would here would rather bring up his limitations, not his achievements. The Corinthians there, remember, they're being told by voices around them, including these super apostles, and, and greedy at that, that Paul was pitiful. Look, I mean, they say, look, he's been, he's been stoned, he's been beat up, he's been thrown in jail, he's been opposed in many places where he's preached, he's weak. Which, I mean, do you really want to follow this guy as your leader? And Paul doesn't argue. He says, I was beat up. I was jailed, I was, um, I, but that's completely consistent with the foolishness of the cross. God is using the shame, weakness, and public disgrace to spread the gospel, just kind of like he did with the cross, Paul says. You can see God's not playing according to the rules of this world. Paul says, I am weak, but he is strong. I'm beat up, but you can see that God's power is stronger than the powers of this world that attack and assail his people. The gospel endures and spreads even when God's people face hardship, sufferings, and attacks. In a, a world that is often obsessed with gaining and exercising power, the church of Jesus, our focus is rather on the weakness of the cross. The church a lot like Christ crucified, often looks weak, looks beat up, marginalized, small, unimpressive. In fact, maybe the church shouldn't fight quite so hard to have power, strength, and prestige. Perhaps we should embrace sharing in Christ's suffering instead of fighting tooth and nail to avoid it. I 
find some comfort in Paul's message of weakness because I too am a sinner. I, like Paul, am a sinner and yet, ah, can you go back? I, it didn't go as fast as I wanted. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm a sinner and yet Paul uses me. He, no, not Paul. God can use me uh, and God can use you as well. You see, God doesn't need perfect or strong or awesome people. He can use us. The Corinthian church was certainly not the most popular place to hang out. Paul was not the most attention-grabbing public speaker in Corinth, and yet the Lord was speaking through him. See, the kingdom of God is not a matter of conquering others. It's not about us voting to get our way. It's about the power of God a power from on high. You see, God has not come to dominate us. He, he could have very easily if he wanted to, but our God has come rather to die for us. God's kingdom won't advance the same way that the kingdoms of this earth advance. He needs no military. He doesn't need any help from humanity. Rather, as Jesus sent out the apostles and gave them the command to preach and teach repentance, so, too, that is one of our weapons, preaching repentance, and also our other weapon, faith. We may, it doesn't always look like we have, uh, God's, that God's kingdom is advancing, but um, God's kingdom does advance in, in what seems like weaknesses, in, not in displays of strength. God's kingdom advances when the gospel is preached. God's kingdom advances when we believe in the promises of God. And that's why as Christians, um, we find our comfort not in the power that the world offers. We find our comfort in Christ crucified. It doesn't always look or feel like we're victorious, but the cross of Jesus tells us otherwise. We may suffer, but God has given us true power from on high. Power that comes from the Almighty Heavenly Father, power that comes from high, from the Son of Man lifted up high upon the cross for our salvation. We don't only acknowledge His power, we depend upon it. And when all our powers fail, we know that Christ's love will never fail us. As the Lord told Paul, so He tells us, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so with Paul, we also can be content saying, when I am weak, then, then he is strong. In Jesus' name, amen.